is brand awareness. So one is the customer needs to know you exist, how they buy from you. So it's like Patrick Hello, everybody. Welcome to Marketing Mondays number 85. Hey, everybody. How you doing? Uh, we are glad you guys are here uh, or watching however you may be watching this. Uh, and uh, at least for us, we were talking before, we got a bit of a snowstorm here. So we're sitting under ice here in Chicago and probably about two inches of snow. So hope everybody's staying warm up there. And I hope you guys all had a great Thanksgiving and Got to spend some good time with your families and uh, and just kind of relax and ate turkey and did whatever you guys do, shopping or Absolutely. football, whatever it might be. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, great, great Thanksgiving week. It's actually, I love this time of the year. Obviously, a lot of people would say that, but between Thanksgiving and Christmas, you really have a chance to start planning for the next year. Focus on the, you know having a really good month, but also just spending time with family and friends. I mean, it's it's one of those times of the year where I try to get everything done that we need to get done, but also you know peel away as much time as I can to spend time with family and friends because it's uh, it's it's one of those times where you know it, you just don't get you don't you know when you start thinking my kids are a little bit older now and you start thinking about the fact that you got basically eighteen christmases with uh, your kid at home and you know hopefully they come home after that 18 but i'm saying i mean you really start to value each one a lot more so no absolutely uh i know it was probably a rough football weekend for you that's but that's one of those things that happens that's i yeah. i never we didn't talk about it at all so my condolences to yeah the- <laughs> I, I don't even want to talk about it let's just uh, you know yeah. Sometimes it's better left unsaid. It's definitely uh, between the Buckeyes and the Browns. It was not a great weekend for sure. And then mine's still shaping up. I Gophers lost the Badgers. That one always hurts too. We lose the Axe and we got the Bears tonight. So in any case, uh, I did want to, as you mentioned too, this is that time of the year that everybody's kind of planning new things. And that was yeah. kind of my theme when picking up uh, the questions that we got this week. Um, and so we'll kick it off. And one of the ones that I kind of get sporadically is, is a content calendar a good idea? And I'll jump in and, and kind of hit off this one to start. And for me, I think it is a good idea uh, to kind of plan everything out, having an idea of what you want to do and, and kind of structure it. I think a lot of people need the structure that, that kind of having a content calendar can bring. My biggest worry and pitfall that I think a lot of people could come into that is if you're not a structured person and you try to set yourself up with a content calendar and you miss a couple of days, yeah. it's one of those things where it, people can kind of just like a New Year's resolution. It's like you go work out three times and all of a sudden you stop and then it kind of goes away and you kind of give up on it because you missed a couple of days. And so I think the biggest thing to do is when you're thinking about having a content calendar, it should just be like a consistency calendar. Like just try to be consistent and not try to think that I got to, I know Gary V preaches eight things, eight pieces of content a day. And that might be, that might work for some people, but if you can try to do two or three pieces of content a week, and even if you only get one, like, again, it's just trying to be consistent and don't give up on yourself because you, you missed a few days. And that's, I think the, the thing that a lot of people will kind of stumble over and like, Oh man, I, I didn't do it these last couple of days. So it's like, I might as well just stop and not worry about it. But it's like, it's put making yourself kind of get out there, do it. And even if you miss a couple of days, just try to get back up on the horse and do it again. Yep. No, I think I, one, I think this is a great time of the year to talk about this because a lot of people, you know, some people's business is extremely busy at this time of the year. And some people's business is a little bit slower at this time of the year. And a lot of times people, when they're slow, they're kind of like, oh, what can I do? You know, but the reality is if you have a good, you know, in addition to a content calendar, I I would say, because to me, they're kind of the same thing. I would have a social media or content scheduler so that when you do have time, you literally can sit down and you can schedule posts because sometimes people don't have time every single day or three times a week or whatever. So what could help is if you have a scheduler where you could sit down when you do have a couple hours and maybe schedule a couple weeks in advance. 
so that you could then just forget about it and know that those posts are going to go out on a regular basis for the next couple of weeks. So I think the idea of a content calendar is a great idea, but to me, I look at that as intermixed with a scheduler so that you could basically, when you have time, get ahead of the game. And then, you know, hopefully you can stay a couple of weeks out of the game when you can carve away some time. Um, because realistically, once a week gets started and it's busy, sometimes it's hard to break away three times a week to do a post. But if you have a moment and you can sit down and do that so that you know that, hey, I'm working a couple weeks in advance. That way, if you get busy, you still, when you go get go get back to it, you still may only be one week in advance, but now you're scheduling the stuff for two weeks out or three weeks out. So it allows you to kind of get ahead and hopefully stay ahead. Even if you have a busy week, you're not missing posts. No, for sure. I think obviously we use a scheduler and that's one of those things for a few clients. It's you try to get those few weeks ahead and whether it's something at the beginning of the month that you kind of, all right, the first week I'm going to set aside two hours and just use a scheduler and I'm going to post something once a week or twice a week. And then I can forget about it for the whole month, which is nice. So having the the use of some of that definitely helps, but yeah, it's, and, and that in itself will help you be consistent because then, like I said, you can just kind of, all right, let me focus on business and I don't have to do anything else. Exactly. Right I know for me, I tend to, when I'm doing different things, I like to do it when I'm in the mindset. Like if I'm in the a creative mindset, I like to dive in and spend a couple hours doing that and not be jumping around at different things. If you're the same way, the scheduler really you know benefits you because when you're in that creative mindset, then you can get a couple weeks in advance and then focus on the operations of your business or you know paying the bills or doing the work or whatever else you have going on. But you really have to kind of get the mindset to create posts. And you don't want to do it as like a side thing, like, oh, in the middle of five other things I have going on, let me go ahead and post. I mean, it's probably, you're probably not going to produce your best content when you're yep. doing it that way. And, I, and I, we mentioned programs that you can use, but I think you can do this within a lot of the different social media apps. I know for YouTube, you can set up and either post it live or you can set it to go specific days. I do a lot of that for our, our cut up videos. I know for Facebook, you can schedule yep. stuff within the app. I'm not sure about Twitter or LinkedIn, but I'm sure that if you, if you dig long enough, you can find something that's similar to that. Yeah. I'd be surprised if they didn't have a scheduler within the app for majority of all of them. So it's just a matter of finding it. And then that way, if you, once you figure it out, I know within Facebook, you can go set up the different things and, and it's, so then you're not having to, there are like, we use options where it has all the different social medias kind of bundled in the one. You can kind of do it all, which is obvious yep. essential for us to do our work. But if it's, you're only focused on one, I think just kind of dive in and find out where I can do the scheduling within the social media apps. Yeah. And again, we, we don't, you, we use a paid uh, program to do ours, but I would not be surprised at all, especially if you're not doing a crazy amount of posting that you can't find free schedulers online that you could utilize. Usually a lot of them have a free option. And until you get so large that you're managing more too many profiles or things like that, it's a free option. And then it's a paid premium version. So take a look around just at social media schedulers. You probably can find a free one that can help you out a lot and help you get, you know, stay ahead of the game with regard to your posts. So our next question, uh, so if we're sitting here, if, especially for a lot of tinters, you might be having some slower time. So it might be a time to kind of dig into some of the analytics you have, but that might be overwhelming for a lot of people. So one of the questions is I have all this analytic data. Where do I start to actually understand it all? Okay. Um, I'm assuming when they're talking about that, they're talking about website analytics like Google analytics for their website. You could also have like analytics for if you're running Facebook ads and things like that, like how that's working. But let's just talk about like the basics. Um, obviously, you know, you want to understand on your website, you know, how much traffic you're getting. If you're running advertisement or you're doing SEO or you're doing things like that, is your traffic increasing? You know, more so, you know, in our industry where we work with a lot of people that have a very seasonal business, is your traffic increasing when compared to previous years? So you don't want to compare your November number maybe to August 
but you know you want to compare your november number to the prior november number to see if you're trending up so traffic is one thing you also want to understand where the source of that traffic is are you getting that traffic with organic search results are you getting that traffic because of paid advertisement that you're doing are you getting that traffic you know from which platform are you getting it from specifically like facebook or instagram are you getting it from uh, you know, Yelp, or are you getting it? Where are you getting the traffic from? It's going to help you understand where the efforts you're putting in are paying off in the form of traffic to your website. You also want to see how long people are spending on your website. That could be a really telling part of your analytics. If people are spending a very short amount of time on your website, there's two different things I'll talk about here. There's a thing called bounce rate, which means people have left your website from the same page they came in on. So they arrived at your website, either didn't see what they were looking for or didn't engage them, and they went ahead and left from that same page. That's called a bounce. It's called bounce rate. So how many people that come to your website leave from the same page they arrived? That could be a concerning metric if it gets too high. The other metric is how long people spend on your website. If people are only spending, say, 10, 15 seconds on your website, that might be an indication that the user experience on your website is lacking, so you're not engaging people quickly. Maybe you're bringing them into the wrong page. I see a lot of situations where people run Google AdWords for, uh, let's just say, home window tinting, and they bring people into their home page on their web, not the home page for home window tinting, their home, actual home page for their website. And what you're doing there is you're causing people to then have to take another step to try to find the information they're looking for. So if you're running an advertisement for automotive paint protection film or home window tinting, make sure you're bringing that person right to the link on your website for automotive paint protection film or home window tinting. Because if people feel like they have to search around and they don't really know where they're going to go, they might just leave from there. So you definitely want to make sure you bring them in to where the one of the first things they see is information that they thought that that's what they were looking for. That's gonna help. And then, then if people are still leaving early, if the time on site is not good, that might be an indication you may need to change around your website, create a better user experience, because for whatever reason, you're successful in getting the traffic there, but then they're not liking what they see and they're leaving. So, um, those are a couple of metrics I would keep in mind. Man, there you get to the back of Google Analytics, there is mountains and mountains and mountains of information. But without overwhelming you, those are just some of the things I would say to keep an eye on that you might want to understand, like where your traffic is coming from, what efforts you're doing or yielding results. And then when somebody arrives at your website, what kind of experience are they having? Are they bouncing out? Are they spending a very short amount of time? Um, you know, things like that. And, and you might be able to see too that when you're bringing people into certain pages, certain pages, they may stay a long time and other pages, they may leave very quickly. And it may tell you you need to do work on those pages that they're leaving quickly from and the other page is fine. So you can really, when you start to peel back the layers of the onion, really understand a lot of where your, your marketing efforts are succeeding and where they're falling short. No, absolutely. I was going to just cover quickly like the social media aspect. I know I'm looking at the our YouTube analytics. And so it's very similar, like you mentioned, uh, with the website. So whether it's watch time and that kind of mirrors how long somebody kind of stays on a video, then and you can kind of look through these and whether you go to like your YouTube studio is kind of where you're going to see that stuff. And so it depends on if you are making videos, if you're on social media, then there, and if you have a business account, I know sometimes a lot of people will just kind of create a personal uh, account for their business. But if you actually switch it over to a business account, I think one of the only downsides is you might have limitations with audio if you're trying to do reels and stuff. But I think the benefits of being able to see like how many accounts you reach, how many people are engaging with your stuff. And so those are things to understand and, and realize when you can kind of see what's going on if you are creating reels for the first time and then notice, oh, I'm getting a lot more non-followers seeing my stuff versus if you are just putting up static pictures and kind of just seeing, okay, I'm getting my followers are seeing it and I'm not really getting a lot of engagement. And so kind of understanding and kind of peeking into if you have a professional or a business account and you go to your profile, there'll be a little tab 
across that says professional dashboard. And if you yep. click on that, it'll kind of break up and kind of give you the analytics that's there and dive into that if you haven't kind of peeked at that, because that way you can kind of see whether your followers are growing and your accounts, like I mentioned, the accounts engaged or the content that you shared. And it kind of breaks down each yep. piece of content and shows you what, what, what's being, uh, what's been more active or kind of pulled people in more. And then that be, that kind of gives you a guide if you want to spread that across different social medias yep. and realize, oh, okay, this is working here and this is working here. So it definitely gives you the benefit of understanding like, okay, here's the analytics. And yes, we've kind of thrown a ton at you. And especially if you aren't a numbers person and don't like it, it at least with this, like it kind of shows, I'm looking at one right now, like followers is green. So it's no different than a stoplight or anything or a green light like it's going to show you kind of colorize and give you an idea like okay this is where you're growing this is where things are kind of staying stagnant uh and this is where things are going down so definitely kind of dive in and, and, and kind of look at all those different things if you haven't yeah absolutely and and here's the thing we come on here every monday or we try to so if you start looking into your analytics and you have questions about specific analytics this is a perfect place to come on Monday, ask us a question in the comments. We'd be happy to answer it. It's almost impossible for us to under, to completely explain it because there's so many data points, but we would be happy if you have questions about specific data points or how your campaigns are doing or how your analytics are looking. We'd be happy to answer those. And I think it'd be beneficial for other people listening as well to understand how we would dissect those. So if you have questions about that, please go ahead and put them in the comments either this week or next week or whenever. And we'd be happy to you know, help you understand those a little bit better. And that kind of leads us to the next one. So if you do start on trying to understand what all this data is meaning, and especially we're coming to the end of Q4 and you kind of want to think about how am I going to start spreading my budget around? And one of the questions I get is where do I start when considering a marketing budget? And so that's kind of a big question for a lot of people. If you're a small business, like, what what kind of money should I be segmenting off to the side for social media, for Google AdWords? And we've yep. kind of mentioned this a few times, but I think we want to hammer it home because it's important. If it's something that you want to grow, your marketing is obviously going to be a part of that. And so yep. I'll, I'll let you kick it off. Like, where do I well, start when considering a marketing budget? I mean, kind of a just a basic rule of thumb that a lot of people over the years have thrown out there is, you know, look at your revenue of your company and between if you're doing it yourself or if you're paying somebody or whatever, the total cost of marketing, including what you're paying Google, paying Facebook, whatever the case may be, you should be looking at that as roughly 10% of your revenue. So if you're a $250,000 company uh, and you're looking to grow your business, if you're in a growth mode, you're probably looking at potentially spending $25,000 a year total in marketing. And that's between you know, your ad spends and your management fees and things like that. Um, now, you certainly don't have to spend that, but that's kind of like one of those business rule of thumb type things is 10% goes back to marketing. Just to give you a couple tangible things to think about, depending on the size of the market you're trying to reach, um, so if you're in an inner city, you're going to have to spend more to get your ads out there because you probably have more competition and there's more people. If you're in a smaller town, maybe you know, a population of 20,000 in the middle of your state and there's not a lot of other big cities around, you can probably spend less if you're just trying to reach those 20,000 people with your ads. So you know, where you're located at is going to have an impact how much competition there is as far as people that are also advertising in that area is going to have an impact because the more people that are advertising, the higher cost per result you're going to pay and the faster your budget's going to go. That being said, I tell people all the time, you if you if what you don't want to do is take a very small budget and try to spread it across too many platforms because then you're not going to get results anywhere. You ought to be able, even in a small market, you're going to have to probably spend $10 a day in advertising costs to get any real results, that, whether that's Google AdWords or whether that's uh, Facebook or Meta. That's kind of the floor. Like, you know, if you're not spending $10 a day, you're probably not going to get results. If you're in a bigger market or you have more competition, you probably ought to need, you know, think to be increasing that. 
So if you do the math on that, that's roughly $300 a month in advertising on both Facebook and or Google if you want to run it. So if you want to run both, you're going to need at least a minimum of $600 a month in just advertising costs. Um, again, think of that as the floor, not the ideal. If you're, in a, if you're in a big market with a lot of competition, you may have to spend a lot more than that. We have clients, you know, I don't want to name any names or anything like that, but we have clients that spend in the neighborhood of, you know, um, $30,000 plus per month in, um, in Google AdWords. So, you know, just to give you an idea of where it can go, it can be all the way up there, or it could be $500 a month or $1,000 a month. But my point is you really, it doesn't do you any good to spend so little that you're really not going to get any impact. So if you look at those as the floor, and then based on how big your market is, how much competition is there, you got to go up from there. Yep. I was just going to say too, and it's one of those things to consider whether it's 10% of the your budgeting or your revenue, it also needs to be a part of your time and not trying to understand it. So I'm not going to say 10% of your time, but if you're a business owner, obviously you're kind of thinking about stuff 24 seven. So it's, you have to make sure that you kind of segment time to, to understand like, what am I doing with all of this money and, and trying to understand it rather than just trying to say, I'm just going to throw money at it because yeah. it's what I need to do. You definitely don't want to do that. <laughs> definitely do not get in the mode of just throwing money at it because it, it's, you know, I don't want to use the term saying any, but, but money, Google and Facebook will consume your money rapidly and you will potentially get no results if you don't run the ads properly. So you know, better off not even doing advertising than to do it without the proper knowledge of what you should do because they will consume money. And I, I talk to people all the time that are like, I tried running AdWords or I tried running Facebook ads or whatever, and they didn't work. And when I really dig into what they did, they either ran a Google AdWords smart campaign or they used a boost button on Facebook. And those are like a shotgun approach type thing. It's like hitting the easy button at Staples. It's like, you know, it might be easy, but that doesn't mean it's going to get you results. And especially if you have a tight budget, all the more reason you need to be really focused on how you're running those ads because you don't have money to waste. If somebody's throwing a ton of money, they may be able to just by sheer volume of money they're spending to get results. But if you have a tighter budget, all the more reason you have to be really conscientious about how you're running ads to make sure you're not wasting that money. Absolutely. I think that's at least that's the reason that we're here. If you guys have questions, whether it's trying to figure out how to create an audience of how to how do I figure out who I'm targeting? Like, that's why we're here. That's why we put these out is especially too if like you said, if you have a very tight budget or no budget, it's like you need to and you want to grow versus just kind of knocking on doors. And if you want to use social media or using any type of email campaign, there's so many different things that you can do that one don't cost money. Granted, it's going to take time and understanding of what you're doing. And the only way that you get understanding is going on YouTube like we do if we have a question and say, how do I do this? And you watch a video. And that's kind of the reason why we put these things out. So if you have questions, please leave them in a comment, send us an email, send us a message of some sort on one of the social medias, because that's why we want to help you out in, and figure yeah. out how you can get from no customers to more customers. Well, and just the other thing too, is just to help you not, you know, not waste money. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, I feel bad when I talk to people that have spent a lot of money and not gotten any results because it's, you know, because they've not looked into it or they've had, somebody that they thought they trusted, take advantage of them or whatever. They're, you know, I would rather see somebody pause and not run advertisement until they really understand it. We really try to even educate our clients as to what we're doing. A lot of them are just like, don't worry about it. I trust you. Run. But I really want them to understand what we're doing because I want them to understand how things are being run so that they don't, you know, they need, they don't need to necessarily do it every day, but they need to have at least a working knowledge of what we're doing. So they understand what they're paying for and how the results, what they should be expecting in the form of results. If you don't understand what a company you're working with is doing, and you don't have a, a good understanding of how your money's being spent, 
set up a meeting and ask them to walk you through it because you really need to understand how your money's being spent and what you should expect with regard to results and then measure what, what your expected results are against what's actually happening. And if it's not if it's not giving you the expected results, then potentially changes need to be made or adjustments need to be made. But you just don't want to feed money into anything blindly. You need to understand what you're doing or you, you set yourself up to be taken advantage of either by the platforms or by another agency. I mean, no, it's just I, that yeah. simple. Marketing is one of those things you can't just set it and forget it. I think we've talked about this plenty of times. The marketing atmosphere evolves constantly and, and just saying I'm going to do the same thing, you're going to be out of date or within a year or two just because of the way that things are going. Whether And when we have calls, I hear you talking about that you tweak this or that with the AdWords every month just because there's different things that you start noticing. And so that's kind there's of- client, There's clients I go into, I, there are clients that we I go into their AdWords account every week and make yep. tweaks to their, ad, to their ad account. So you know, we have clients that because of the nature of what we're running with them, I'm literally in there every single week monitoring what's going on. And some weeks there might be a lot more adjustments than others, but it's definitely not a set it and forget it. I mean, definitely. So our next question is, it's one of those things, think about if you're trying to get a new customer, what is the customer life cycle? And this also pertains to kind of, I had a question I was going to do last week was, how do you, the customer retention, how can you kind of understand what a customer is going through? And we can kind of use the, the example of kind of a tint shop, whether it's somebody comes in for one item and then you might offer, they yeah. come in for window tint in the summer and you could send them an email blast or something in the fall, like make sure to protect your vehicle in the winter, whether it's if you live up north with salt and whatnot, and you can kind of try to bring people back in. How can you what is that kind of customer life cycle and how can we pull it in with marketing? Well, I think the first thing is, uh, you know, we always want to bring in new customers. It's always, people always want to like say, Hey, you know, how do I get more customers? And what a lot of times people miss is the business that's right underneath their nose with people they're already doing business with, whether that's potentially selling the existing customers, they have an additional service while they're coming in to get, something done or or adding on to the current service that they're offering or potentially having them uh, you know come back for additional services or doing things that cause existing happy customers to tell more people about your business so I think you need to look at every customer as you know a light you know you, you say customer life cycle I like to look at it like how can you treat your customers such that they become lifetime customers? You know, so that they come back to you time and time again, or are willing because they're so happy with what you've done to tell their neighbor, tell their sister, tell their, you know, tell their coworker, whatever about your service. So, you know, one the first thing is you have to hit the ball out of the park with the existing service you're working on them for. If they're not happy with that, you're dead in the water. The next thing is making sure they're aware of all the other things that you do. I'm amazed because we work with a lot of people in the window film industry. How many of them have an automotive division and a residential commercial division, but they don't do anything to tell either side about the other side? So people are, you know, eight cars a day are coming through their shop, but they're not leaving them a trifold or anything like that to tell them, hey, we also tint homes. So if you have a glare problem at home, we can help you out at home as well or your commercial building or whatever. Likewise, they do somebody's home and they don't make them aware that, hey, we also do cars or they go into a commercial job to do decorative window film for privacy, frosted film, but don't talk to them or let them know, hey, we also do solar control film that can help prevent heat and glare and things like that. So I think that you have to approach every situation like not being pushy about it, but make them aware of the other things that you offer. So they can't say no to something if they don't even know, or I should say they can't say yes to something if they don't even know you offer it. Yeah. So it doesn't mean you have to be pushy, just make them aware. It could be as simple as uh, a rear view mirror hang tag that tells them care instructions on one side for their automotive window tint. And then the other side, it talks about the residential and commercial products you offer. Now you have one piece of collateral that you're hanging up there that tells them this is how you, 
you know, this is what you should expect the next couple of days and how to take care of the window film, but also exposes them to the fact that you do other things. Maybe even has a tear off section that they could give to a friend to get 10 or 15% off their next service or something with you. My point is, look at every customer as a potential lifetime customer and what you can do to continue keeping that revenue flowing and not in a way that you're trying to take advantage of somebody, but in a way you're actually providing a service that's valuable to them or somebody else that they know. And uh, again, I think too many people focus on the transaction they're working on right then and not what they can do to expand that transaction. I apologize. I'm getting no, carried away on long, uh, long answers here. You you took the word I was just about to say about stop worrying about. I, under Even if you're a small business, I think sometimes you might, at least for me, when it was like, okay, I finally got a client and or it, granted for a lot of small businesses, that transaction might be somewhat of a high. And it's like, yes, we, we got the sale and kind of move and then you kind of move on to the next one. When just like you said, yes, you should be concerned about that transaction, but it also it's focus on the relationship. Ask them what questions that might work with that could pop the idea in their head of like, oh, I could also use this. And I saw it with a lot of different window tint shops that were kind of or businesses that were automotive that were starting to come over to window tint, whether it was a car wash. And yeah. they, it's those questions like, what else could we offer you that we might be within the realm of reason for us? And even if it's something that you don't offer, that gives you an idea that if you do ask that same question to 10, 15, 60 different customers, and you kind of keep getting that same response back, like we could use this, then it might be something to consider pulling in. I, I worked with a, uh, a fertilizer company when I was off doing different yep. things and they started doing vent cleanings and carpet cleanings. And it was all stuff like, how can we help you? Because if there's something that we're doing uh, seasonally, how can we kind of bring you back in yeah. later on? This kind of goes with a lot of different, with well, the on, life cycle. if you, again, I, I preface it by saying you got to knock the ball out of the park with the first transaction. But if you do, you've already crossed that threshold with that customer. They've already had a good experience with you, which means they're that much more likely yep. to trust you with a, 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 for, a, a future transaction because they've already had a good or refer you to somebody because they had a good transaction. Uh, I have an auto mechanic here in the city that I live in, and I'd love to give his name out. I mean, he does such a great job. If anything, when I pick my car up, I typically am negatively sticker shocked by how fair he was with me on the price. And when anybody ever asks where to take their car, I can't wait to give his name out. I mean, because I just he's he's just instilled such a great feeling in me about doing business with him that like literally I if I literally leap at the chance to give his name out to people. And think about that if you can, and and I probably in the last couple of years have only done maybe five or six transactions with him. But my point is hopefully by, I know several of my neighbors use him now and you know, that him treating me right on the first transaction led to three, four, five more transactions with me and untold number of transactions with people I tell about him. Yeah. So no, it's definitely, I have the same thing. There's a couple of mechanics I enjoy going to. And we're a little bit over, but we got one last one. We've kind of covered this in the past, but I think it's something to think about seasonally and kind of moving forward if you have a slower season. But could you explain evergreen content and how can I use that through the slower seasons? Um, really simple, because I know we're over. Evergreen content is content that doesn't like, isn't aged. Like, you know, it it's going to continue to be relevant in the future. So if you're talking about the benefits of, uh, you know, if you're talking about the benefits of automotive window tinting, the basic benefits of automotive window tinting probably aren't going to change. So, you know, an article about the benefits of automotive window tinting could be considered evergreen content. Now, if you're talking about a piece of content that's referring to an upcoming car show that you guys are going to have a demonstration at, that's not evergreen content because once that car show happens, that content is no longer relevant. Um, so a really easy way to think of evergreen is, 
you know, in a year, is it still relevant? Is it still applicable in a year or does, or is it aged or is it like uh, something that's important for today, but three months from now is going to be not like right now, a lot of people are running holiday specials. Those aren't evergreen content because when the holidays are over, those specials will go away. But if somebody talks to, you know, if somebody is posting something about the core benefits of their product or some, F, you know, answering some questions about their product that are is not really going to change, that would be content that would be evergreen content. So again, when you're thinking about things to put on your website with refer with, with regard to blogs or articles or things like that, try to focus on things that are evergreen content. That doesn't mean don't sprinkle in things like, you know, an upcoming car show, things like that that you're doing. But the evergreen content is going to be something you can continue to benefit from for a long time. You could even go back and there's actually a lot of things I've, I've watched about um, the benefit of content on your website. If you go back and freshen that content up and bring it forward and repost it as a new piece of content freshened up from last year when you posted it the first time, it will actually be beneficial for that content versus creating a, a brand new piece of content. You can actually get additional benefit out of that. So, you know, Evergreen content could be something that you once you have it on your website, you could go back occasionally and refresh it, maybe add a little bit of new information, repost it again, put it back out on your social media again. And it's just as relevant today as the day that you created it. You know, so again, um, yeah, I, I the one thing I think of as far as with evergreen content is especially if it is during a slower season, you're still staying in the mind of the customer. And so like you said, if you can kind of feature the benefits, even if it's, especially right now, if it's winter boots, obviously that's going to be something that people are going to be uh, wanting seasonally. But if you can kind of give the benefits throughout the year, when it comes time for the purchasing time period, you kind of are first in mind. If you've, if they've been seeing your ads or kind of things throughout the year, uh, one of the things I keep thinking of too, it was like climate control film. It's one of those things where especially if it's a product that can be used throughout the year, but kind of has different uses, whether it's at least with climate control, you can kind of hold in heat and stuff during the winter and it, it keeps the cooler air in the house during the summer. So there are a lot of different things that you can do, but obviously me just saying that is highlighting a benefit of the product. So if you well, can kind of do that throughout the year, that's going to be beneficial to you. And I think even if it's not, I agree with you a thousand percent there, but even to use your boot analogy, I mean, if you write an article about five things to look for uh, when buying a quality set of boots, like to sort of identify whether it's a quality set of boots or, you know, something that's going to last or, or or not, that's evergreen content. Now, you running something about a sale you have coming up on boots or something like that might not be evergreen content. But if you own an outdoor shop and you post an article about, five things to look for when buying a quality set of hiking boots. Mm -hmm. That's going to be evergreen content, you know, unless technology in the industry massively changes, then you might need to refresh that content. But assuming that's not the case, that's going to be evergreen content. And it might be something that, you know, you could sporadically sprinkle out there during the year. Cause even if somebody's not buying boots, it, it's a seasonal item they still might be interested in an article about the things to look for to make sure they're making a good purchase with regard to boots. Yep, absolutely. And we will wrap up there. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, it's I'm glad we're going to try to do a similar to these kind of conversations with, as we move through Q4 to kind of think about the things that you want to get going and rolling through the new year. Um, so uh, thank you, Patrick. This was number 85. We're closing in on that 100 wow. episode. So uh, it's it's going to come soon enough. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving uh, weekend with their family, friends, whatever. Thank you for tuning in on this Monday. I know the Mondays after Thanksgiving holiday could be sometimes hectic. So for everybody that tuned in, we really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. See you next right. time. Take care.